Alhamdulillah, we've reached ayah number 36 of Surah at tawbah and inshallah we'll be able to cover a, a few of the verses following it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah at tawbah ayah number 36, إِنَّ عِدَّةَ الشُّهُورِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَشَرَ شَهْرًا فِي كِتَابِ اللَّهِ يَوْمَ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ مِنْهَا أَرْبَعَةٌ حُرُمْ ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ القيم فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَقَاتِلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ كَافَّةً كَمَا يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ كَافَّةً وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Truly the number of months in the eyes of God is 12 months laid down in the book of God. The day He created the heavens and the earth. Of them, four are sacred. That is the upright religion. So do not wrong yourselves during them and fight the polytheists altogether just as they fought you altogether and know that God is with the pious. Now a new topic is being introduced and here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the months that make up the year and Allah azza wa jal says that these 12 months that we have, now irrespective of whether you, you assign them English names or Arabic names, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights here that this 12, these 12 months are not arbitrary. You know, this is a cosmic reality that is at play. يَوْمَ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ That this has been decreed, that the earth will function in a way whereby there will be 12 months. Minha arba'atun hurum. Among the 12 months in the Islamic calendar, there are four that are sacred. And the sanctity of these months, these four months go back to the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam. There are four months that were considered sacred even before the advent of Islam, even the Arabs during the pre-Islamic era, they had special reverence for these four sacred months. Now, what are these four months? They are the Qa'da, the Hijjah, Muharram, and the month of Rajab. Now, the Qa'da, the Hijjah, and Muharram, they are consecutive, as you see one after the other. So three months back to back are considered sacred months. And then you have a gap. And then the next sacred month is the month of Rajab. Now you may ask, why is it that there is this idea of sacred months whereby fighting is prohibited? This, my dear brothers and sisters, highlights the primacy of peace in the Islamic tradition. You know, human beings naturally are gonna get into conflict. And sometimes that conflict escalates into, into battle, into bloodshed. And therefore you find that these four sacred months were instrumental in reducing conflict between warring tribes. You see, brothers and sisters, imagine you're fighting against a tribe, and then and then the month and the battle is very heated, and then the month of the Qa'dah arrives. There has to be a ceasefire to observe the sanctity of the month of the Qa'dah. So you have one month passes, and then you have the month of the Hijjah, and then you have the month of Muharram. If two tribes are fighting, and then you have a three-month pause, a three-month you know, postponement, the likelihood that they're going to continue fighting after three months is relatively low. So you find that in the Abrahamic tradition, generation after generation, this idea was passed on that there are sacred months in the year 
where fighting is prohibited. And you find that this was instrumental in suspending a lot of the, the violence that was very common in that region of the world and at that time. Also, you find that these four months allowed for people, people to perform Hajj and Umrah safely. So because the Hajjah is a month, uh, is one of the sacred months, the Qa'da is also a sacred month, it allowed for people, and Rajab was the time for, for Umrah, it allowed people to engage in these acts of worship without fearing for their safety. So these four months were instrumental in reducing war and bloodshed among warring factions. And it allowed a time of peace, a time of reflection, a time for people to engage in ibadah, in worship without, without this fear of violence, without fearing for their safety. Now, what I want to draw your attention to, brothers and sisters, is this ayah has a tafsir and it has a ta'weel. You see, the Quran, brothers and sisters, has many layers. The Quran has an apparent meaning that is accessible to all people who study it, who become familiar with the Arabic language, who analyze the grammar and the syntax, who study the context of the revelation. This is tafsir. But there are certain dimensions, there are certain aspects of the Holy Quran that are inaccessible to us. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ Allah in Surah Ali Imran, He says, no one knows the interpretation, the hidden meaning of the Quran except God and those who are firmly rooted in knowledge. وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ Meaning the Ahlul Bayt. Notice Allah doesn't say, وَمَا يَعْلَمُ تَفْسِيرَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَالرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ Tafsir is something that the, the understanding of the verse at a superficial level could be accessible to even a non-Muslim. A non-Muslim may write a tafsir of the Qur'an. But in order to gain access to this deeper understanding of the Qur'an, the batini meaning of the Qur'an, the ta'wil of the Qur'an, we have to refer to the family of the Prophet. Now, there was a man by the name of Jabr al-Ju'fi. Jabr al-Ju'fi was one of the most prominent companions of Imam al-Baqir And this man, he had the wisdom and the thirst for knowledge and the intellectual curiosity that motivated him to ask Imam al-Baqir about this ayah. Because when you read the verse, it seems that Allah is, is not just talking about months, that there's something deeper at play here. Because Allah says, that this is something related to the upright religion. Now, if the Arabs of Jahiliya observed the sanctity of the four sacred months, then technically, you know, what is the Quran talking about here when it says, this is the upright religion. Is Allah saying that the mushrikeen are following a deen al qayyim? So that there, there's something deeper here that's being addressed. So Jabir al Ju'fi, he asks Imam al Sadiq about the ta'wil of this ayah. It's interesting how much detail he gives. Jabir al Ju'fi, he says, When I asked Imam al Baqir about this ayah, he says, Fatanafasa Sayyidi al Suada. He says, when I asked Imam al-Baqir about the interpretation of this ayah, he says the Imam took a deep breath and he sighed. It's as though what the Imam is going to share is something that is unknown to most people. That most people do not really appreciate the message of this ayah. So the Imam sighs. And what does he say? He says, Ya Jabr, Amma Sana. So now the Imam is going to share 
the esoteric meaning of the verse. And this is a dimension of the verse that unfortunately the Imams were not permitted to discuss in public settings because of the Umayyads and the Abbasids. So Imam al-Baqir says, Ya Jabir, amma sana fahiya jaddi Rasulullah. The Imam السلام, he says, as for the year, the year is a symbolic reference to the Prophet. And then he says, and a year is made up of 12 months. وَشُهُورُ هَثْنَا عَشَرَ شَهْرًا So it's as though Imam al-Baqir is saying that if you imagine that Rasulullah is one reality, there are 12 reflections of this reality. This The year is made up of 12 months. What are these 12 months? It is Ali ibn Abi Talib, who is the, one of the months. الحسن, and then Hassan is the next month. Here, we're talking about the symbolic meaning. الحسين, and then after Al Hassan, you have Al Hussein. And then after him is my father, Imam Zain al Abidin. And then I come after that. And then after me, my son Ja'far. And his son Musa. And his son Ali al Rida. And his son Imam Muhammad al Jawad. And then his son Imam Ali al Hadi. And then after is Al Hassan al Askari. Muhammad al Hadi al Mahdi, and after him is the Mahdi. Ithna Ashara Imaman, 12 Imams. So here, Imam al Baqir he says, months here are a symbolic reference to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And then the Imam says, fi they are the proofs. Of God against His creation, and they are the trustees of His revelation and His knowledge. And then the Imam comments about the four sacred months. So you have twelve months, and then you have four that are sacred. The Imam says, "As for the four that are sacred." الَّذِينَ هُمُ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمِ The four sacred, the four ones that are sacred, which Allah calls His upright religion, ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمِ أَرْبَعَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ يَخْرُجُونَ بِسْمٍ وَاحِدٍ He says, of the Imams, of the twelve Imams, four of them share the same name. عَلِيٌ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Ali ibn Abi Talib, the first Imam, he has the name Ali, which is derived from the name of God, which is Al Ali. And then you have Imam Ali ibn Hussein, he carries the same name Ali. And then you have Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida, our eighth Imam. And then you have Ali ibn Muhammad Al Hadi. Then the Imam, Imam Al Baqir, he says. فَالْإِقْرَارُ بِهَا Believing in them, especially these four, هُوَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ That is the upright religion. فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Do not uprong yourselves with respect to them. أَيْقُولُوا بِهِمْ جَمِيعًا تَهْدَدُوا Believe in all of them, so you will be guided. Now it's interesting that these four Imams are mentioned as being representative of the upright religion. Why? Because there are some Muslims who believe in Ali ibn Abi Talib, but they may reject other Imams. You might have people who believe in Ali ibn Abi Talib, uh, Imam Zain al Abidin, but they don't acknowledge the Imams after him. You might have people who believe in the Imam of Imam al Sajjad, but they reject Imam al Rida. 
but you don't have anyone who believes generally if someone believes in the Imam of Ali ibn Abi Talib and Imam Zain al Abidin and Imam al Rida and Imam al Jawad, most likely such a person will believe in all 12 Imams. Whereas there are some who, in, who might only believe in Ali ibn Abi Talib and they might be Zaydis or Ismailis or Waqifis. But if your Iman reaches Imam al Jawad, السلام, we don't really have individuals who believe that Imam al Jawad is an Imam, but they reject the 11th, the, the, the 10th, the, the 11th, and the 12th Imam. If you believe in Imam al Hadi, chances are that, not Imam al Jawad, Imam al Hadi, that you will embrace all 12 Imams. This is the upright religion, to believe in all of them, to embrace them. Because all of these Imams are reflections of the Holy Prophet So if we have a hadith that say, you know, where the Prophet says, Fatima bab'atum mini, Fatima is a part of me. And we can extend this to all of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, that they are, they're all a part of the essence of the Holy Prophet and then you find that Allah says, وَقَاتِلُوا الْمُشْرِكِينَ كَافَ at the end of the ayah. And fight the polytheists altogether. Now this doesn't mean that you fight all of them, but you fight, rather you fight those who are fighting against you. So fight against the polytheists altogether, meaning be united. The only way that you, you will be able to defeat your enemies is if that is if you have the spirit of unity. Kama yuqatilunakum kafa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fight the mushrikeen all together, be united, just as they fight you all together. You know, it's very interesting that the enemies of Islam throughout history seem to be united. Abu Sufyan and his supporters, they were united in their campaign against the Prophet. Those who fought Ali ibn Abi Talib, they were united. But the, the real tragedy is that Ahlul Haq, the people who are on Haq, they're the ones who are bickering with one another. This is why Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he famously said that I would trade 10 of mine for one of Muawiyah's, which means they're so loyal to Muawiyah that Ali ibn Abi Talib says, I wish I had someone, people in my camp who are who are going to be loyal to me as Muawiyah's supporters are loyal to him. And then Allah says, Know that Allah is with the pious. Now Allah, of course, is with everybody. Allah is close to all of us. But when Allah says that He is with the pious, it means that His support, that He will support the pious, that He gives them His special attention, His special guidance, His special support. Ayah number 37. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. إِنَّمَا النَّسِيئَةُ زِيَادَةٌ فِي الْكُفْرِ يُضَلُّ بِهِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا يُحِلُّونَهُ عَامًا وَيُحَرِّمُونَهُ عَامًا لِيُوَاطِئُوا عِدَّةَ مَا حَرَّمَ اللَّهِ فَيُحِلُّوا مَا حَرَّمَ اللَّهِ زُيِّنَ لَهُمْ سُوءُ أَعْمَالِهِمْ وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الْكَافِرِينَ Allah says truly the postponement, nasi'a, is but an increase in disbelief, whereby the disbelievers go astray. They make lawful one year and forbid it another, in order to reconcile it with the number made sacred by God, thus making lawful that which God has forbidden. The evil of their deeds is made to seem fair to them, 
but God does not guide the disbelievers. Now, the word nasi'a is used. Allah says nasi'a is an increase in disbelief. Now, what is nasi'a? Now, nasi'a means to delay something, to postpone. You know, even in Islamic jurisprudence, we have this concept in commerce that it's valid in Islamic jurisprudence to, to purchase something and then pay later. So, you know, so nasi'a is that you buy something, but you defer payment, that you postpone payment. Nasi'a. Now, what is, what is the meaning of nasi'a? So we spoke about this idea of four sacred months, which was recognized even by the Arabs of Jahiliyyah. Now, this is one of the few things from the Abrahamic tradition that most of the Arabs adhere to. But sometimes, what would they do? Sometimes these Arabs, they would postpone the sacred months. So imagine, imagine for a moment that you have two tribes who are fighting. And let's say they really hate each other. The Qa'da arrives. One month, no fighting. And these, some, of, some of these people are itching to fight. Two months pass by. And they can't wait any longer. So what do they do? The month of Muharram arrives, for example, and they say, "Okay, the month of Muharram, we're not going to we're not going to consider it a sacred month this year. We're going to postpone it to Safa, right? So we'll consider Safa a sacred month, which means that they would postpone, they would delay the ruling of sanctity to another month." Now, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mention this? And why does Allah say that this is a continuity of your kuf? Now, as I mentioned earlier, that when you take a break for that long, it's difficult to rile your motivate your soldiers to get back into the battle. So a lot of these Arabs, when they were engaging in military conflict with one another, a three-month waiting period was detrimental to the morale of their soldiers. You know, so what, what they would do is that they would manipulate the sacred months. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this to us because I think there's a practical lesson here. That... The Arabs during the time of Jahiliyyah, they would manipulate God's laws for their own convenience. And, and you have to ask yourself, do we do this? No, this is the reason why Allah said this is ziyadatun fil kufr. This is an increase in disbelief. Because the spirit of servitude to Allah is not that you change God's law to accommodate your lifestyle, but rather you change yourself to conform to God's law. And this is the underlying lesson here, brothers and sisters, that even though Allah is speaking about the things that, you know, the Arabs were doing in Jahiliyyah, we do this today in, in 2018. We manipulate God's law to accommodate our lifestyles. So for example, it's haram to sit on a table where, where alcohol is being served. Some of us will, will alter the ruling for our own convenience, or will even justify it. And this is exactly what the Arabs of Jahiliyyah would do. So they would postpone the sacred months. So they would consider Muharram to be a regular month, not a sacred month. And they'd say that it will make Safar sacred just to ensure that at least we're considering four months out of the year to be sacred. So we canceled Muharram, but we replaced it with Safa. This is why Allah says, 
They do this in order to reconcile it with the number made sacred by God. Now, we do this. They do the, they, so the justification is what? That we're still observing the sanctity of four months. We're still not going to fight for four months. Who cares if it's Muharram or Safar? The point is that we're making it, we're reconciling it with the numbers, that, the number of months that Allah made sacred. And this is what we do, brothers and sisters. You know, typically, you know, when people commit sins, many people, they commit haram. And what's even worse is they try to justify it. And this is what they were doing. They were manipulating the law of God. And they were providing an excuse, a justification for it. True servitude to Allah is not that you change the law. You're supposed to change yourself. This is the true meaning of ubudiyah. So this idea of putting forth excuses when you violate the law of God is something that we see. And this is why there, there's, a, there's a, a story that a group of people, they came to this one alim, to a scholar, and they said that, Molana, we, we came to you today because we want to apologize to you. You know, we've been backbiting against you. We've been doing riba against you. And we ask you to pardon us, to forgive us. So he says to them, as for the layman's, I forgive you. But I do not forgive the ulama who backbited against me or the students of Hawza who backbited against me. So they said, why? They say, because the layman, you know, when they make a mistake, you know, they'll ask for forgiveness. But some of these ulama, some, some people who have knowledge, they'll justify it. They'll justify doing riba against me by saying, oh, he's a fasiq. He's a corrupt, he's an openly corrupt person and there is no riba. It's not considered backbiting if you speak about someone who's openly corrupt. So you see that there is this tendency, especially when you learn a little, you learn a little bit of fiqh here and there, you start to do what? You start to justify. You, you look at non-mahram and you say, no, no, this was the first glance, even though that first glance lasted for three minutes. You put forward justifications, you make excuses. So this is one practical lesson that we can learn. Also, going back to this idea of four months, suspending conflict for four months, we can even apply this into our, our lives, that when you see two people who are fighting, who are at each other's throats, whether they're siblings, spouses, friends, that it's healthy to take a break, just to take a break. Go and prescribe a cooling down time period. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did with many of these people. That when you when you give people a break, when you separate them, when you forbid them from fighting for one month, two months, three months at a time, the likelihood that they're going to get back into it is very slim. So sometimes a cooling down period, a break, is very effective in putting out the fires of animosity. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam. I know. Hope you're okay, inshallah. Uh, Sheikh, in uh, Ayat 36, yes. uh, you mentioned uh, Waqafi. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, can you throw a little light on differences between uh, Waqafi, Nasibi, and Mutazali, and Ashari, uh, please? So. And uh, sorry, and uh, there's another question. Uh, is uh, Ibn Arabi a Nasibi? Was he a Nasibi? Uh, please kind of explain. So I'll answer the first, the, the last question first about with regard to uh, to Ibn Arabi. Now Ibn Arabi is 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 a very controversial figure, and he's controversial because 
sc scholars, especially Shia scholars, they uh, they differ regarding who he was and uh, and his position. So, for example, you have individuals like Allama Tabatabai, Shahid Mutahari, Imam Khomeini, who consider him to be a great Arif, and you know they used to teach his books, you know, Futuhat uh, al-Makkiyah and his other works. So you have some who consider him a great Arif. And then you have other scholars who consider him Nasibi. They consider him someone who is anti-Shia because of some of his writings. Now those who defend Ibn Arabi, they say that his works were either distorted or you know, he was he was in Taqiyya. And there are scholars who are in the middle who say that we don't know. So with respect to Ibn Arabi, there are those who consider him to be a great Gnostic, a great mystic, a great Arif, someone who believes in the Wilayah of Ahlul Bayt, salam. And there are those who reject, reject the, the notion that he's a follower of Ahlul Bayt and consider him to be a Nasbi. They say because if you look at, and if you look at some of his writings, if you go by the apparent meaning of what he says, there are things that he says that contradict the Quran, that contradict, you know, uh, you know, some of the statements of the Ahlul Bayt. There are other scholars that might have their own ta'wil and their own interpretation. Now that that's for another discussion. But in a nutshell, Ibn Arabi is controversial because you know some consider him, and there are two extremes. So you have those who say that he's the greatest Arif to have ever lived, and then you have others that say he's a Nasib. He's someone who harbored malice towards the followers of, uh, of Ahlul Bayt, and he has, and some of his statements run in sharp contradiction to the Quran and to uh, the statements of Ahlul Bayt. So he's a controversial figure. Now, with respect to you know Waqifis, Ash'aris, and Mu'tazilis, now Waqifis are a sect of Shi'ism. They're individuals who believe in the imama of all of the imams and they stop at the seventh imam and this was done so they reject imam ali ibn musa Rida. now why did this happen the answer is money some of the the wukala some of the representatives of imam al-kadhim who were collecting religious dues when Imam السلام, was imprisoned, you know, they have all of this money. After the death of Imam al-Kadhim, they have to hand it over to who? To Imam al-Ridha. So what did they do? They said that, you know, he, he went into, some say that they, he went into Ghayba, and they considered uh, Imam al-Ridha to be an illegitimate Imam. So they can hold on to, uh, to their funds. So there, were, there was a financial dimension to this. They, they were not willing to hand over the uh, the khums or the religious dues to Imam al Now with respect to the, the Ash'aris and the Mu'tazilis, these are two theological schools within Sunni Islam. Now the Mu'tazilis were a theological school that really believed and promoted the use of, of Aqid in, in formulating uh, Islamic theology, and we have a lot in common with uh, with the Mu'tazilis, and uh, there are certain areas where we defer defer with them. So, for example, the Mu'tazilis believe in Allah's justice. The Ash'aris are another theological school within Sunni Islam that, for example, they believe in in predestination. They believe they they don't believe that God has to be just. And the majority of the Sunni world are Ash'aris. So there are certain beliefs that they hold that, uh, that have been refuted by the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. And of course, th there are a lot more details, but generally Mu'tazilis and, uh, and, uh, and Ash'aris, there are theological schools within, uh, within Sunni Islam. Mu'tazilis, for the most part, they don't, they, they don't exist today. 
the dominant theology in the Sunni world are the uh, the Ash'aris. So um, you said that the four holy months uh, relate to the twelve, four of the imams, the imams named Ali, uh, and mentioned that believing in them was especially important. Yeah. Uh, because that means you believe in all 12. And this kind of ties into what you're saying right now. It seems like if you just believe in Imam al-Hadi, that would be enough to guarantee that you believe in all 12. Pretty much. But so what? what is especially pivotal about all four of these Imams that makes them so key? No. Imam Ali and Imam Hussein are kind of obvious. Or sorry, Imam Zainal Abdin are a bit. Look, go ahead. So if you if, if we look at the, the hadith from Jabr al-Ju'fi, the only reason that the Imam states as why these are sacred, he says, Minhum wahid. It's because they have the same name. They are all Ali. Beyond that, we don't we don't know. We don't know. It could be that you know all of the Imams Ali Musam they played a very pivotal role in the preservation of the uh, the message of the Holy Prophet. But aside from the fact that they share the same first name and and believing in all of them guarantees belief in all 12 of them, we don't know exactly why specifically, you know, Imam Ali, Imam Zain al-Abideen, Imam al-Ridha alayhi salam. We don't know. I mean, at least off the top of my head, I don't I don't recall anything that uh that would explain why these specific four, other than what the Imam or Imam Al Baqir mentions in the Hadith. Okay, yeah, because I mean, with at least the Imam Ali and Imam Zain Al Abidin, you can say that Imam Ali was the start of the split, and maybe Imam Zain Al Abidin believing in him is how you understand what happened to Imam Hussein. Yeah. And with the last two, it's a bit more uncertain. With the you know, with, with with Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida he was put in a very awkward position by Ma'mun. And you know, a lot of a lot of the Shias condemned, you know, some of the some of the more ignorant Shias, you know, questioned the wisdom of Imam Ali Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida. You know, number one, why did you accept this the heir apparent position to Ma'mun? You know, why are you dressed in expensive garments? So, you know, the Imam alayhi salam, Imam Rida alayhi salam was really the only Imam after Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib who actually had some political power. So it was it was a very awkward time for the uh, the followers of Ahlul Bayt. And it, it, these these also could be times where the, you know, the Ummah was, uh, was, severely tested but again beyond what the imam salam explains it's all speculation we don't really know why these uh, specific uh, four are mentioned other than the fact that they that they share the the, the same name and um do we have any idea what the similarity was between the prophet and a year if they're the kind of the analogy being made and what connections would the two have had other than having 12 parts why the prophet is why a year symbolizes the prophet yes i i honestly i really don't know i have there's no comment in the books of tafsir regarding why the prophet would be seen as as uh as the year Allahu i guess maybe the the third unusual oddity was like a because it seems like all the four sacred months, they're all in a row, except there's a one month gap between Ramadan or right after Ramadan. So, yeah. before Ramadan, so Raja. So, the Shaval, right? Is so, a, or maybe a miss. So, so, so Rajab is the next. Uh, so, you have the Al-Qa'da, Al-Hajjah, Muharram, and then you have a break. And so, Rajab. So, Rajab is the. Uh, the next uh, sacred month. So you have three that are in a row, and then you have one that's kind of, that stands alone, which is the month of Raja. After Ramzan is Shabal, and then the month after Shabal, that's one of the four holy months, right? Yeah. 
so it's kind of going that way around. It's just a one month gap between the. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. I see. What you're saying. So, that was just kind of interesting. We have a one month holy month and a one month gap, and then three holy months in a row. So. Yeah. So I mean, I, I, it's it's definitely uh, it's meant to be a very it should be an effective way to to reduce uh, con can, can you imagine being at war and then you have to take a three month break or a, especially I mean that 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 many interruptions would uh, would hopefully you know put out the the fires of animosity and, and ensure some degree of peace. Right.